Welcome to our recorded service of worship and our call to worship here is from Psalm 95. O come let us sing to the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Well, we are encouraged to sing the Lord's praise. Uh, Julie will play a, a verse through now of one hymn, and then we'll have a, a, another hymn later on. Uh, just one verse she'll play through. It's now, it is praise to the Lord the Almighty. And if, you're, uh, if you've got a, a new Christian hymns available, it's number 28 there. Come to the Lord in prayer. O Lord our God, who is great and almighty, who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit, how great you are, O Lord, for you have created all things, and by your power all things are sustained. O Lord, you have created us too. And we thank you, O Lord, that you have made us and that you have made us in your own image and likeness, that we may communicate with you, that we may know you and that you may know us. We thank you, O Lord, for that great power also which has caused us to be born again to a new and to a living hope, that we may rejoice in Christ and may rejoice with you. Thank you, O Lord, for the resurrection of Christ that he has been raised from the dead, that we may be raised to new life with him. Our Father, we thank you that we can meet in this way over uh, the distance, uh, although the distance is not great to you, O Lord. But we thank you that we can meet with uh, this virtual recording and uh, with this service that we can worship you in. O Lord, you are worthy of all of our worship. And we thank you, Lord, that we may worship you in this way. Our Father, we pray that you will be with us in all that we do in our service. Help those who are watching and listening at home. We pray for them, Lord. We pray that you will draw near to them, too, at this time. We pray for those who could not join us, and we ask you, O oh Lord, that you will be a great blessing to them, too. Our Father, we pray that you will help us to sing your praises as we are able to, that we may consider you in music and in song. We pray too, Father, that you'll help us to understand your word as we consider your word. 
And so we come to you, O Lord, praying for your blessing upon us, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We are continuing in our series in Deuteronomy, and we're still in Deuteronomy chapter 1, and it's Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 34, through to the end of the chapter, which is verse 46. But I'll read that for us now, and then we'll join together in prayer again. So Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 34. And the Lord heard your words and was angered, and he swore, Not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him and to his children I will give the land on which he has trodden, because he has wholly followed the Lord. Even with me the Lord was angry on your account, and said, You also shall not go in there. Joshua the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter, encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. And as for your little ones, who you said would become a prey, and your children, who today have no knowledge of good or evil, they shall go in there. And to them I will give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn, and journey into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. Then you answered me, We have sinned against the Lord. We ourselves will go up and fight, just as the Lord our God commanded us. And every one of you fastened on his weapons of war and thought it easy to go up to the hill country. And the Lord said to me, Say to them, Do not go up or fight, for I am not in your midst, lest you be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you, and you would not listen, but you rebelled against the command of the Lord, and presumptuously went up into the hill country. Then the Amorites who lived in that hill country came out against you and chased you as bees and beat you down in Seir as far as Hormah. And you returned and wept before the Lord. But the Lord didn't listen to your voice or give ear to you. So you remained at Kadesh many days, the days that you remained there. May the Lord bless his word to us. Let's turn again to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we do give you thanks for all that you have given to us. We do give you thanks, O oh Lord, that you are a great and mighty God and that you are able to do far more abundantly beyond what even we can imagine or think. We give you thanks that you have made us your own, that you have called us in Christ to be your sons and daughters, that you have named us your children and set us aside of our Lord Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son. Thank you, our Father, that you have entered into covenant relationship with us, promising to be our God and declaring us to be your people. We thank you, our Father, for Christ, our Saviour. We thank you, O Lord, for his death upon the cross for us, and that his blood was shed so freely and so fully for us. We thank you, O Lord, for that blood sprinkled upon us, that we may be clean, that we may be sanctified and set apart for your use. Thank you, O Lord, for the power of that blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, not residing in the actual physical blood, but in his death upon the cross and in his willingness to be that sacrifice which atones for our sins. Thank you, O Lord, that we may know forgiveness, and we do seek you, O Lord, that you will forgive our sins. Father, we pray for ourselves as a, a congregation at this difficult time. We pray that you will keep us safe from the coronavirus, and we pray, Lord, that the outbreak will soon be quelled, we do pray for any who may be self-isolating at this time. And we pray, Lord, that they will recover soon and that it will not be a case of coronavirus, but of some other illness. We pray for our relatives too, Lord. 
and our friends and we pray for them that they too may be spurred and kept free and we pray father that you'll grant to us courage at this time that we may not be afraid and lord even when the thoughts of this outbreak come very close to us even perhaps if we have contracted uh, 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 something ourselves a respiratory illness ourselves or even if a loved one has or lord even if we go out into the streets that are so quiet or go into the supermarket where the, the shelves are empty we pray lord that we will not fear that we may trust in you we do commit our nation to you we pray for the doctors and the nurses and others who serve in the National Health Service. And we do pray for the NHS, Father, that it will be able to cope with the increased stress that is put upon it at this time. And we pray, Lord, that this virus outbreak will be curbed by your mercy. We confess, O oh Lord, that we have no right to call upon you, but we throw ourselves upon your mercy, O oh Lord. We pray you will have mercy upon our land. We pray, Lord, that this outbreak will be a wake-up call to our land, the call that will cause many to think of you and to turn to you. We pray, Father, that you'll forgive the sins of the land going back many generations, but accelerating in recent generations. We pray, Lord, that you will forgive us. And we confess our sins to you. We pray too, Father, for the other lands that are affected and pray that you'll have mercy upon them. And, oh Lord, we commit to you the work of mission. Thank you for the missionaries who've gone out into the world. We pray that you'll keep them safe at this time. We also pray, Lord, that they will have a hearing for the gospel and perhaps even in this time of uncertainty and fear and anxiety that many more will be willing to listen to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for the growth of your church throughout the world. And Father, again, we commend ourselves to you and pray that you'll be with us during this coming week. Watch over us, we ask you, Lord, and keep us safe, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray before we come to the consideration of God's word. Well, Lord our God, Help us to understand your word, we pray, and help us to apply it to ourselves, that we might live by you and be obedient to you. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at Deuteronomy, and uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1 in particular. Deuteronomy is, in many ways, Moses' farewell address to the nation. The nation has wandered 40 years in the wilderness. The Lord has been with them during that time. And Moses is now addressing the people on the plains outside of east of the Jordan. They are about to enter into the Promised Land. They're about to go across the Jordan and that miracle of the separation of the waters that happened at the Red Sea when they went across that. That will happen again and they will go across the Jordan when it's in full flood and they will enter dry shod into the land that the Lord has promised them. But, for, but first of all, Moses gathers them. He recaps their history to them. He gives them instructions for living in the land. And he blesses them too at the end throughout their history in the land. They have gone to Sinai. They have received the law. They have journeyed on 30 odd years ago from this point that we're considering. They've journeyed on to this place, Kadesh Barnea, just to the south of the Promised Land. And from there, they should have entered the land. What they did was they sent out spies, uh, 12 of them, to represent the 12 tribes. And the spies went up into the land and spied it out. And they came back, first of all, with an encouraging report of how good a land it was. But then they started to be afraid and they started to transmit their fears and anxieties to the whole of the people. And so they took away the heart of the whole of the people. That's all of the spies except Caleb and Joshua. They were two of the ones who went up, but they were the two who stood firm and who said, we must trust in the Lord. We must obey the Lord. We must go into the land and the Lord will enable us. 
But they rebelled, they refused, and they even wanted to go back to Egypt. And the Lord sought to encourage them through Moses. This is uh, verse 30. Do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And then 34, verse 34. And the Lord heard your words and was angered, and he swore, not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give to your fathers. And verse 34 gives us the chain of events. The people sin, God hears, and then there is an outcome to their sinning. So first of all, the people sin. It's a painful fact. The fact of human sin is a painful reality. And the fact that people will sin even when there's no outward pressure to sin. It just seems to come up from inside of people, from inside of you and me and us. Uh, even when there's no outward pressure, sin is a reality and it's not to be excused. And the catalogue of the sins of the people here is not covered over. They were complaining about God. They weren't complaining to God, they were complaining about God, and they were ungrateful to God. And in many ways, the sins are catalogued in these first five books of the Bible that Moses wrote. And the culmination of their sin came in this refusal to enter the promised land. This was the very thing that God had brought them out of Egypt for. He brought them out to bring them in, he brought them out of slavery in Egypt and brought them in to freedom in him in the promised land, but they refused to enter. Their sin was that of disobedience and rebellion, verse 26 there, and yet you would not go up but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. Their rebellion was occasioned by their unbelief. It's attested to us in Psalm 95, and Psalm 95 is expounded in Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, Hebrews 3.19 rounds off the exposition there, and that says, So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Unbelief is not merely an inability to believe. It is a refusal to believe. And at base, it is a rejection of God. Their unbelief led them to fear, and their fear led them to rebellion. Their fear and their rebellion as an expression of their unbelief stopped them from entering into the Promised Land. But they were afraid. Yes, fear. Their unbelief led to fear. And fear and unbelief reinforce each other. They feed off each other. Each one growing plump through feeding off the other. And to break this cycle of fear and rebellion and unbelief, we need to tackle the base thing, unbelief. To tackle unbelief is to break the cycle. To not fear and then trust will grow. Trust and fear are mutually exclusive. They vie for space in our souls. They cannot exist together. They cannot coexist. Trust and fear are exclusive of each other. Well, there was an antidote to their fears. 
there were two things. They had seen the work of God. So verse 29. Then I said, do not be in dread or afraid of them. And Moses there recounted to them, he's recounting how he recounted way back when, a generation ago, that they had seen the Lord and his mighty acts and his power. And uh, this we, we would have looked at last time. But also they had the witness and the example of Caleb and Joshua. We have the testimony of scripture. We have the Lord's voice speaking to us through the scriptures. But we also have this cloud of witnesses. Just like Caleb and Joshua would witness to the truth and stand up for the truth. And we also have the testimony of Christ himself. When in the Garden of Gethsemane he was tempted to disobedience under great pressure and stress and strain, but resisted. We have many commands in Scripture, many times over it says, fear not. So in overcoming fear, it is that root sin and foundation sin of unbelief that we need to tackle. Uh, we shouldn't confuse fear with uh, anxiety. There is room in the kingdom of God for the anxious soul, but there is not room for the unbelieving soul. Fear is that which prevents us from doing the will of God, stops us. And its root and its foundation is unbelief. So the people sinned, and their sins were expressed in the words. The Lord heard your words. And it culminated in their rebellion against God. And then, second point, God hears and is angry. Sin is never private. It can be hidden from other people for a while, but never from God. Our hearts are open to God in a way that they are not open to other people and perhaps not even open to ourselves. Our hearts are fully open to God. And it says the people murmured in their tents. They were indoors. They, they thought nobody could hear them. They discussed things in whispers and low voices amongst themselves. They plotted amongst themselves. They murmured in their tents, but even in private and even in their own thoughts, God heard. And sin has consequences. There's no such thing as a crime that hurts no one. And there is certainly no such thing as a sin that has no consequences. God becomes angry at their sin. We don't often think about the anger of God, but it's there in all the pages of the Old Testament very clearly that God is at times angry. It's one of his attributes. It's not like human anger, which is so often, often reactive against a, a situation. It's not like human anger that sometimes it just completely misses the mark, but God's anger is always just and right. It is never held unreasonably. And his anger must be propitiated if we are to be reconciled to God. His anger must be removed if we are to be reconciled to God. This is what Jesus did on the cross. He there bore the anger of God. He there bore the anger of God against human sin. Not against the sin of every human being, but against the sin of God's own people. He bore the anger of God. And it was done, it was finished with. That is propitiation. So the people sinned. So God hears and is angry. And then thirdly, there is an outcome. And this is the outcome. That God swore on oath that not one of them should enter the promised land except Caleb and Joshua and the children of that generation. What a great reversal this is. 
they had said and they had murmured amongst each other in their tents, their children would perish. In fact, they thrived. They entered the land instead of them. They sought safety in a return to Egypt, but they themselves perished in the desert. But even in God's anger there is mercy. And the nation is not wiped out. And there is indeed a promise for the next generation. The people would not be left forever to wander in the wilderness. They would be brought into the land. And the promise comes with a continued leadership, that of Joshua himself. So the Lord swears to them on oath that they would not enter the land. It is an edict of God that will not be changed. But see what they do next. Verse 41. Then they answered me, We have sinned against the Lord, and we ourselves will go up and fight, just as the Lord our God commanded us. And they all fastened on the weapons of war and thought it easy to go up to the hill country. But the Lord said, No, that is not his will now. You cannot, they could not wind the clock back. In fact, this was not an act of repentance. In fact, it was an act of rash disobedience again. And they suffer the consequences again. God has told them that he will not be with them if they try to go up into the land all by themselves. But they did try it. They did try it. And God was not with them and they suffered the consequences. It was not an act of repentance, but again of rash disobedience and rebellion against God. Again with unbelief at its root. It wasn't an act of fear this time. But unbelief this time did not produce fear, but unbelief this time produced this rash action of rebellion, doing things without God. They had taken matters into their own hands and they tried to storm the land by force. Our conclusion, we have a tendency to sin. But unbelief is the sin which stops us coming from God. It's not disbelief in God and his word, but rejection of it. By believing we have the word of God. Be believing. We have the cloud of witnesses. We have God's own testimony in the scripture. We have one who has himself suffered the anger of God and been raised from the dead. Jesus, our saviour. Believe him. He's been there. He knows what's there. He knows what it's like. He can speak with authority to us. Believe him. Do not fear. Belief is the foundation of trust. Don't say, I can't believe. But seek God for faith. And if some things you do find difficult... Seek God about them, especially too. God sees all things, therefore let's confess our sins to God. And our confession of our sin will not be a revelation to God, but it will be an admission to him. And God's anger has an outcome. These people in the desert, they were unable to enter the promised land. Their unbelief made them unwilling to obey God. Then they tried to storm it by themselves. That God was with them initially would have enabled them to enter, but that he was not with them now disabled them from entering. 
they were unable to enter because of their unbelief. And the writer to the Hebrews takes up this point and he says, do not bar yourself from the kingdom of God by unbelief. Do not bar yourself from heaven by unbelief. Do not try to storm heaven in your own power also. But in trust and faith in God. But see also God's mercy. Yes, they wandered in the desert these 40 years. But then that time they were being prepared to enter and to live in the promised land. They, that generation, would perish, but their children would thrive. And in the end, Joshua himself would lead them in. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that you will help us not to fear. We pray, Lord, that we may trust. And we pray, Lord, that trust will drive out fear from our hearts. But we pray too, Father, for a believing heart, that foundation, that root of trust in you, that we may believe all that you have spoken to us in your word, and that we may believe most of all that our Lord Jesus Christ is the remedy for our sin. And thus believing we will not fear. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll have another hymn now. It's In Christ Alone. Just one verse of the hymn. And again, if you've got access to new Christian hymns, it's number 647. close with a benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.